Hello, everyone. As we continue our study in the first portion of Matthew, the fifth chapter, uh, we're looking at the first part of the Sermon on the Mount, which is commonly called the Beatitudes. We'll be looking at the first Beatitude uh, this session and looking at uh, what it means to be poor in spirit. Uh, again, these Beatitudes are the things uh, that make us happy, which is what the word blessed means. When each one of these Beatitudes starts out with the word blessed or blessed are you, uh, that means happy are you. Uh, the things that make us joyful, the things that will give us satisfaction, knowing that we are fortunate to be able to have the rewards that God has given to us, but that God expects a certain attitude, a certain behavior uh, from us. And so we're looking at this Beatitudes to see what it is that God wants us to be, what God wants his children to look like. And that's certainly we can get that from looking at these Beatitudes. So in Matthew, the fifth chapter, uh, beginning in verse three, uh, actually it is verse three, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And that's our first beatitude that we're going to look at. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Certainly money has nothing to do with it. When we think of poor, we think of, well, we don't have money. Because that's the common use of the word poor. But money has nothing to do with being poor in spirit. Certainly in 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter, uh, in verses 9 and 10, Paul writes to Timothy and says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, from which some have strayed from their faith in their greediness and perceived themselves through though through with many sorrows. So Paul writes to Timothy and says, those who desire to be rich. And so if you're rich, that doesn't make you rich in spirit. It just makes you monetarily rich. And if you are poor, that does not make you poor in spirit. It just means that you don't have material things uh, or the amount of material things in which one would classify you as rich. And certainly rich people and poor people are all susceptible to sin. Certainly we see this uh, in the passage that Paul writes, where poor people, those who do not have material things, if they have the desire to be rich or they have the covetousness that comes with that, uh, certainly the love of money is going to cause them problems. And so whether you're rich or whether you're poor materially, it doesn't make you rich or poor spiritually. Uh, that is so, when we look at what does it mean to be poor in spirit, it has nothing to do with monetary gain. Being rich does not make you a, a better a Christian or follower of God. And being poor does not make you more noble or more... Uh, a, pleasing to God. But what Jesus said is, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. So let's look at this word poor. This word poor means actually complete and utter poverty. Now, I don't mean just kind of poor with the bare minimums. I mean complete and utter poverty, where you have nothing. Uh, it, it's very similar to the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. When, when Lazarus is described in Luke, the 16th chapter, and beginning in verse 20, uh, Jesus says, There was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at the gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, and moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And so we see here that Lazarus is described as one who was, was poor. He was a beggar. He needed to be laid at the gate. And, and what it means laid at the gate was it doesn't mean that someone carried them and, and just laid him at the gate in some comfortable position. 
What it means is that he was in the street. He was in the gutter. He had no place to go. That was his home. He was laid at the gate because he had nowhere to go. And he had no way to sustain himself except from what fell from the rich man's table. What was given to him by others was the only way that he was able to sustain himself. Certainly he was utterly and completely poor. And that's what this word means. To be the utterly and completely without something. That's the poor. Utter and complete poverty. And he says, you need to have utter and complete poverty in your spirit. Now, that doesn't mean that our spirit is to be without value. Certainly, God values each and every soul. And each and every soul is valuable in and of itself. But what it means to be poor in spirit is that you have to understand that in your spirit, you are completely and utterly poor in that you cannot sustain yourself. We, if we are relying on ourselves and our own spirit, our own spirituality, we are, as Lazarus was, laid at the gate, laid in the gutter. And we are spiritually completely dependent on something else besides ourselves to sustain us spiritually. And that's what we need to realize. To be poor in spirit. To be poor in spirit Uh, by ourselves, we need to understand that we are are completely without God. We have no way of sustaining ourselves. We have nothing without God. That it is God who lifts us up. We need to realize that in and of ourselves, we cannot do anything. So it comes down to who are we going to trust? Are we going to trust our own spirituality? Or are we going to trust in God to sustain us spiritually? In Matthew, the sixth chapter, verse 24, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he would be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So what Jesus says is we need to make a choice. Are you going to trust in this world? Are you going to trust in yourself? Or are you going to trust in God? Are you going to serve yourself and your own needs? Or are you going to serve God? You can't serve both. So choice number one, are we going to try and make it on our own? Are we going to rely on our own independence? Certainly that's the American way, right? I don't depend on anybody. I I will pull myself up by my own bootstraps. And if we are reliant on someone else, that is a sign of weakness. That's the way the world thinks. Certainly that's the way uh, the culture within the United States predominantly thinks. That we need to be independent of others. We need to sustain ourselves. But that is not, uh, in the spiritual world, something that we do because if we depend on ourselves again we have nothing we are just in the gutter so choice number one is do we depend on ourselves or choice number two do we give up that independence do we recognize that we are not uh, independently rich spiritually that we can't sustain ourselves spiritually by ourselves do we understand and do we confess that we need God. Is that the choice that we're going to make? Are we going to confess that that we need God? Are we going to give up that independence? Are we going to make that choice and rely on God and his mercy to to sustain us spiritually? There's no middle ground here. We either rely on ourselves to get ourselves spiritually rich or we rely on God to sustain us spiritually. Those are the only two choices we make. And we need to understand and realize that we in and of ourselves are poor in spirit. And we need to recognize that 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 in and of ourselves we are poverty stricken and we need God to help us. We need God to sustain us. And so we must recognize that poverty 
and make the choice to serve God. In Isaiah, the 66th chapter, verses 1 and 2, the prophet Isaiah says, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. And where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made, and all those things exist, says the Lord. And so we see the greatness of the Lord uh, ex expressed. He created everything. He is everything. He is in heaven, which is his throne, and the earth is his footstool where we live. He created us. We exist by his will. But notice what he says. All, the, all those things exist, says the Lord, but on this one I will look, on him who is poor and of a contrite heart and who trembles at my word. So who does God recognize? Does he recognize the one that says, I can do it myself? God, let me show you how spiritual I can be. Let me show you that I deserve to be in heaven. And I will show you because I will will do the things that you want me to do. And then, and then I will show you that I deserve to be where you are and that we're relying on ourselves. No, God says, I recognize this one. This one I will look on him who is poor and of a contrite heart and the one who trembles at his word, who recognizes the greatness of God, who recognizes that we are poor, completely devoid of, it within our spirit, that we cannot be have our spirit filled without God, that in and of ourselves we cannot do it. Our own spirituality is poor and of complete poverty. And so we must recognize and understand that God favors those who put their complete and utter trust in him, who have a poor and contrite heart, not trusting in self, not trusting in our own deeds, but fully and completely trusting in him and trembling at his word. And then obeying him for that very purpose. There are really three things that we need to do to recognize our spiritual poverty and to accept our spiritual poverty. Because it, it, it's, it's just a reality that we are poor in spirit. But we need to recognize that we are poor in spirit and not try to fill ourselves up with our own uh, values. And so there are three steps to getting to spiritual poverty, to recognizing and emptying our own worthless, uh, independent, self-fulfilling type spirituality but to fill ourselves with what God will sustain us with. The first thing we need to do is, is confess just that. We need to confess our utter and complete spiritual poverty. Remember the uh, parable that Jesus spoke about in uh, Luke, the 18th chapter, verses 9 through 14, about the Pharisee and the tax collector. Let's read that in Luke, the 18th chapter, beginning in verse 9. We'll go through verse 14. And he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. You see, they didn't have that spiritual poverty. And so this parable is for them. Verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. You see, he's just that guy. He's that guy that's saying, look at me. God, look at, look at how righteous I am. Look at my spirituality. Look at all that I do. And am I not righteous? That's not a contrite heart. That's not being poor in spirit. 
but he's relying on himself and telling God about all the wonderful things that he has done and being thankful that he is the kind of man that God wants him to be. But notice the tax collector, verse 13, and the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you this, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. And everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. So do you see the one who confessed his utter spiritual poverty to God? Notice what the tax collector said. He he just went to pray and he just said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That is being poor in spirit. That is fully trusting God. That is recognizing our utter devoidness of spirituality. We must realize and confess that we are totally dependent on God. We must utterly realize and confess that what we deserve on our own that our own deeds, that the, the reward that our own deeds will give us is death. That if we're going to rely on ourselves, that, that in our spirituality, that what we deserve is death. And we must recognize and realize and confess that it is God who nourishes us while we lay in the gutter spiritually. It is God that gives us spiritual uh, food. It is God who will reach down and lift us up. We need to confess and realize that the things that we do, the things that we, uh, the the righteous deeds that we do are really nothing. In Isaiah, the 64th chapter, uh, Isaiah talks about this very thing. In the 64th chapter in verse 6, Isaiah says, but we are like an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses, all those things that we do, all those righteous deeds that we do, all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Because it is our iniquities, our sin to God, our sin against God, that brings us down into the gutter. Because that deed condemns us to death. In Romans the third or sixth chapter in verse twenty-three. Romans the sixth chapter, verse twenty-three, Paul says, For the wages of sin is death. That's those iniquities. That's the penalty for what we give to us. So when we sin against God, that washes everything away. That penalty for sin is death. But notice. But the gift of God, not what we deserve, but what God has given to us, given to us who are are, are devoid and laying in the gutter, poor in spirit, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so we must realize and confess that all of us spiritually are laying in the gutter. And we can fool ourselves and we can think that we're something that we're not, and we can beat our breast and talk about all the great things that we do, but we just must realize that all of our righteousnesses, all the things that we do out of our own sense of importance, out of our own sense of thinking that, that what we uh, do for God will get us some kind of reward, we must recognize that those are just like filthy rags. Because our iniquities bring us to realize that we deserve death. That we deserve death. That we, we, what we do and the righteousnesses that we do are simply and only in service to him. Because we are his servants. Service to him because we are his children. We must also, number two, not only confess our spiritual poverty, but we must confess our weaknesses. You know, it's easier, easy to see the faults and weaknesses in others. We look at others and we just say, well, 
I can see their problem, but it's hard to see our problem, right? Certainly the, the Pharisee in that parable didn't see his true condition. He didn't see his weaknesses, the weakness of pride. But certainly we can see that at other. But we must recognize that God rejects the proud. In, in James, the fourth chapter, verse six, he said, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So those who recognize that, that, that we are nothing, who, who are in that, that state of spiritual poverty, who have that humility, and understand it is through God that we uh, gain all of our spirituality and our nourishment and our reward in heaven. And without him, we are nothing. It is in that and not, and not comparing ourselves to others and seeing our weaknesses as, as, well, I'm glad I have this weakness and not their weakness. Or thinking that we're stronger than somebody else. We just have to realize and confess that we are weak. And that we are nothing without God. We must look at ourselves and not others. We must recognize our complete worthlessness without God. You know, we sing the song, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Is that how we look at ourselves? When we look at ourselves, do we say, well, I am a good Christian. Look at all the things that I do for God. Look at all the service that I do. Look at what I do for the congregation. Look at what I... Or do we understand that we're just a wretch? And that it is only through God's amazing grace that this wretch, that this, this spiritual poor person laying in a gutter is only brought up and only sustained by God our Father through His grace, through His gift of those who would rely on him and trust him and serve him. And thirdly, we must confess our dependence on him, that we depend on him. In Psalms, the 51st chapter, uh, David's writing about, uh, you know, his sin with Bathsheba and the things, and we can read, of course, about all that that made him do and the adultery and ultimately the murder that was committed in trying to cover that up. And thinking in his mind he was doing what he needed to do. But then he realized, after Nathan confronted him, that he had sinned. And in this 51st Psalm, he talks about the wretchedness of that sin. And the, the, the terrible realization that he had committed these acts against God, that he had wronged God. And how terrible that was. And the condition, the, the terrible place that that put him in. He confesses in verse 11 of Psalm 51 that he knows he deserves to be cast away. That's what he deserves. David says, I deserve to be cast away. And then in verses 16 and 17, he talks about how not an animal sacrifices or physical deeds of redemption or anything that he can do is going to save him. But it is only through a contrite heart that recognizes and confesses that we are dependent on God for spiritual life. And he prays to God that he will save him. And so we just need to utterly confess our complete dependence on God and stop trying to be independent and stop trying to, uh, you know, be great in the eyes of others. We just need to worry and, and be thankful that though we are in the gutter spiritually, it is God who has reached down and lifted us up. It is God who feeds us spiritually. It is God who gives us life where there is none. It is God who forgives us of our sins and brings us into uh, spiritual well-being with him. It is through dependence on God and not ourselves. And that's what it means to be spiritually poor. And those who are spiritually poor will inherit the kingdom of God. 
Blessed is the poor in spirit, for they will inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's what Matthew records Jesus as saying in the Sermon of the Mount. Blessed is the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does the world say? The world says, go out and get what you need. Do you want to be part of something? Well, then you need to go out and get it. You need to go prove that you deserve to be there. But God says, those who would be brought into the kingdom of heaven are those who are poor in spirit. And so to be citizens of his kingdom, to be citizens of his church, we need to be poor in spirit. For certainly to be part of his church, to be part of his kingdom is a wonderful thing. We are called in, in 1 Peter, the second chapter, in verse 9, we are called a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special people for those who would be poor in spirit, for those who would rely on him, for those who realize that it is not about us, but it is about our Father in heaven and what he wants us to do. And it is him we trust and that we serve him because we trust him. And we want to please him. We want to do everything that we can. Not so that we deserve to be where we are, but be, or to be uh, citizens of the kingdom, but because God allows us to be. And he has picked us up and taken us there and allowed us to be citizens of his kingdom. And certainly his kingdom is everlasting. In Second Peter, the first chapter, verses 10 and 11, it says, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For an entrance you will, be, will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Into the everlasting kingdom. The everlasting kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. It will last forever. We are part of the kingdom here as part of his church. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a special people of God, and we will always be as long as we are poor in spirit, as long as we serve him because he deserves to be served. We serve him because we are thankful that he has brought us up out of that spiritual gutter. Those who are poor in spirit are citizens of the kingdom of God. They inherit the kingdom of God because that is where God has brought us. That is who we are as spiritually poor people. And that is what brings us joy. That is what will bring us happiness, knowing that we are fortunate, that we have a Father in heaven who loved us, that we have a Savior who came and died for us and shed his blood, that we might have our sins washed away, that God, through his grace, might lift us up out of that gutter and bring us into his kingdom. Thank you so much for uh, studying with me these things. Think about these things. And next week, we'll talk about the next beatitude. May you have a good week, and may God bless you all.